Howdy, amateur astronauts. I hope you're enjoying our conversations on the awesomeness of space exploration. Well, you might not know that Are We There Yet is supported by listeners just like you. So consider showing your support for this show with a financial contribution to WMFE. You can do that simply by visiting WMFE.org slash support, and your gift helps us better explore exploration. Now, let's get to space. From the studios at WMFE in Orlando, Florida, this is the Space Exploration Podcast that asks the question, are we there yet? Hi, I'm Brendan Byrne. You've probably already heard by now, but scientists just discovered an exoplanet that might just be like Earth. And it's pretty close, too. It's only about a parsec or four light years away. Observers discovered it by noticing a wobble in the star Proxima Centauri, and that wobble was from the tug of this exoplanet, Proxima b. Now it's time to verify those results. Joseph Harrington is a planetary scientist in the Department of Physics at the University of Central Florida. He's going to try and spot evidence of the planet using telescopes in space. I took a trip to his office at UCF to talk to him about his work and what a discovery of this magnitude means for astronomy. So just first give me a sense with, uh, of what we discovered here. What, where is this exoplanet located? And give us this, a sense of, of what it is. This is a planet about the size of the Earth, or maybe a little bit bigger, around a star called Proxima Centauri. Proxima Centauri is the closest star to the Sun, and it's a small star. Um, you know, 14%, I think, of the, of the mass of the Sun, and, and less than 1%, much less than 1% of the brightness of the Sun. So it's in the Centauri system, which is near the Southern Cross in the Southern Hemisphere, so we can't see it from Orlando. Um, it is a red dwarf star, which is the, the category of small stars. And what we discovered, essentially, was that this star is wobbling with a period of about 11 days. And that wobble is consistent with a planet orbiting around it in, uh, at a distance that makes uh, where, where liquid water, where water would be liquid on the surface of the planet. So it's a potentially habitable planet. We don't know that it is actually habitable. We don't know that it actually has life or not, but it's uh, pretty tantalizing because the next nearest potentially habitable planets are much, much further away and much harder to measure. How far away is it? You said it's in near Alpha Centauri. What's the distance? Relatively close in the, in the grand scheme of things, right? I would say a number that doesn't mean a lot to, to listeners, which is 1.3 parsecs. Um, that's about 4.3 light years, and a light year is the distance that light travels in a year. Um, not next door in terms of our normal, you know, mm -hmm. we, we can't send a spacecraft there. We can do it in a fiction story, mm -hmm. but we can't do it yet with our technology. Mm -hmm. Or we could send a spacecraft in that direction, and it might take 40 or 50,000 years to get there. Mm -hmm. So it's still far away in terms of human exploration distances, but it is the nearest star. You see an awful lot of stuff out there that's much further away every time you go outside at, at night and it's not cloudy. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned the wobble. That's kind of how they detected this. I, I think it's fascinating <laughs> how they found this planet. Can you kind of walk me through what that wobble is and how uh, observers here on Earth were able to detect that? Sure. So um, since the, the early 90s, people have been looking for these wobbles, and we've now found thousands of extrasolar planets, but only, I think, hundreds by this particular method. It used to be the most productive method, and then the Kepler spacecraft came mm -hmm. along with a different method. Um, but this is the, the, I would say it's the most general method because this method lets you find stuff um, that doesn't go in front of its star. So the, the, when you look at the orbit, um, you have to be pretty lucky to catch a planet that is, or, whose orbit is edge-on as we see it. Mm. Um, most orbits are going to be at some random tilt that doesn't take the planet in front of the sun. That, that's how Kepler finds it, right? Looks for a transiting planet to go in front of it, right? Right. So Kepler uses the transit method, mm. and it looks for the drop in light as the planet blocks some of the light from the star. But not all planets block light from their star because they don't go in front of it, from our perspective. From, from, if we look at them from a different direction, then maybe, but not from the direction we're looking at. So we don't know yet whether this planet is a transiting planet. 
Um, transits have been searched for unsuccessfully on Proxima, but this is a very small planet, so the methods that have been used might not have the sensitivity to rule out a transit in the case of Proxima. In terms of the wobble, Proxima is the, the place you would like to have a planet because it's going to be very easy to observe compared to you know any other star. And that's both because it's close and because the star is dim, so the, the planet is brighter compared to the star. Um, and so, in fact, there's a, there's a fiction book by, by Stephen Baxter called Proxima, which is a story about, you know, visiting and, and colonizing a planet that's like uh, the one that we found. That's, I'm going to say that's not a coincidence. He didn't know about it. We didn't know about it at the time he was writing. But this is the planet you would invent if you could invent the planet. It's just remarkable that we've actually got it. So in 2012, a bunch of folks looked at the data that had already been taken for, uh, for Proxima and said, you know, it's been analyzed, but we've got new methods, let's analyze it again. And they got kind of a tantalizing hint that there might be something there. So they wrote a proposal to do 60 straight nights of observation with the most sensitive spectrograph that we have for studying exoplanets, and, or for searching for exoplanets. And they've been analyzing those data for years to dig this signal out. And then they got a, a decent signal, they confirmed it with a different telescope, and then they submitted a research paper in May, which was just published. The, that wobble kind of detects that there's something there. How are you able to detect what size it is, what it could possibly be made of, or is that even something that, that you can detect at this, at this point? So we can get some of those answers at this point. The amount of wobble tells you how big the thing that's orbiting is. And the, to get the amount of wobble that you see, um, you need about sort of 1.3 Earth masses or a little bit more. So so 30% heavier than the Earth or bigger to make that amount of wobble. Um, so from that, we know that it can't be a gas giant planet because those are hundreds of times the mass of the Earth. Um, we also know it's not an asteroid because that's not enough size or a comet. Um, so there's a, a couple of types of planets that it could be. It could be a terrestrial planet, like the one that we're on right now. Um, there's another thing out there called a super-Earth, which we don't have in our solar system. Uh, super-Earths are uh, a couple times, sort of maybe twice the mass of the Earth, uh, and they can have substantially thicker atmospheres. Uh, so that's also a possibility. Um, and this is all sort of by process of elimination. We haven't seen the planet yet. We've only measured the motion of the star. That is, like, so cool. <laughs> like, I think that is so neat <laughs> that you're able to, to, just by looking at the way that the light shifts and, and be able to, to find it. So, so what's the next step then? How, how, do you, how do we see it? Or can we? So the next step is a, uh, a step I'm involved in, which is searching for transits. We hope that it transits. The probability of transit isn't high, it's about one and a half percent. But um, we also haven't eliminated that yet, and so we're hoping that there's a transit. And there are a bunch of different telescopes that are, that are looking, and the team at this point is going over those data and trying to, uh, you know, trying to pin down, does this thing transit or not? If it does, then we will get directly the size of the planet right off the bat. Um, and if we can, if if we're really good, or we do look with a future telescope like the James Webb Space Telescope, we will be able to see the planet go behind the star, and then that tells us how much light it's emitting or reflecting. So we learn about the planet uh, from its from the planet's own emitted or reflected light, and the spectrum of that light would tell us something about the atmosphere of the planet. So what specifically is your role? So you're going to be just kind of employing all of these telescopes to actually look for this thing and see if you can grab a picture or an image of it? Well, we won't see... The, directly imaging the planet is a different technique, and there's a different team that's working that problem. Okay. And that would be really cool, and I think that they should be able to do it. But uh, for the transit method... Uh, there are a number of different ground-based telescopes that are uh, that are working, and there are applications that have been put in to get time on space telescopes. Uh, and you know, we're going to put it all together and try to pull something out. It's a very weak signal. It's an Earth-sized planet is really small in the grand scheme of things, especially even you know even against a star like Proxima, 
which is much smaller than the sun, it's still a star, and this is still you know an Earth-sized planet, so it's going to be a tough signal to fish out. So when you think of transits, you're thinking of light changing over time. So as the planet goes in front of the star, the total amount of light that you get from both objects is smaller because the planet is blocking some of the starlight. And so let's say that the planet's... Um, oh, it, uh, a typical Jupiter-sized planet would be 1% of the cross-sectional area of its star. And so you'd see like a 1% reduction in the light. Gotcha. And uh, in this case, both the planet and the star are scaled down. That also works out to roughly a 1% reduction in the light. Oh. So we have to get a 1% dip. I think with a space telescope, it should be a slam dunk. With some of the ground-based telescopes, um, you know, if you get even a little bit of cloudiness, um, it can be challenging. Uh, I, I think, you know, part of what's been a challenge here is that we, this thing orbits in 11 days. That means once every 11 days you get a couple of hours in which you might have a transit. Um, that doesn't actually give you all that many opportunities um, from the time frame of discovery to now, right? It's only been a few months. Uh, I think, you know, a year from now there will have been a lot of ground-based work to try to pin this thing down. Um, and the space based telescope should also have, have done some observations as well. We certainly hope they will. And when you when you say an eleven day orbit, that's quite different to our Earth, which is three hundred and some days around. That means it must be closer to this star, right? And how is it able to be that close, and still have you know the same you know characteristics of a habitable planet? Then the key is in how bright the star is, right? The it is a eleven day orbit is a much smaller. It's much smaller than Mercury. Right, um, this star is I, I, a few tenths of a percent as bright as the sun. So you have to be closer to it if you want to be as warm as we are. In fact, the the uh, what we call the equilibrium temperature, the, the temperature that this uh, planet would have if it was a naked rock with no atmosphere, um, is about 20 degrees Celsius below freezing. Um, Sorry, about 40 degrees Celsius below freezing. Well, that's not terrible. The Earth would be 20 degrees Celsius below freezing. We have an atmosphere. It's like a blanket. It keeps us warm, right? So if this planet has any sizable atmosphere, it'll have liquid water. Uh, water is pretty, pretty common in the universe. Uh, we think about it as rare because when you look at Mars, it's dry. When you look at the Moon or Mercury, it's dry. But, uh, in fact, there's plenty of water in Venus's atmosphere. It's just all water vapor. Um, there's water in Jupiter's atmosphere, but it's below the clouds. Um, you know, it, it, uh, it, it, Jupiter's cold enough that it snows below the cloud deck that we see, which is ammonia crystals, right? So, but but waters. I mean, there's water on the sun. It's just you know, it, it it's a very common molecule. So uh, certainly there's going to be water, uh, and there's water on Mars, but it's frozen in the polar caps, right? Um, but it used to flow liquid on the surface. We now know that because of the Mars rovers, and so. Uh, this planet almost certainly has liquid water. The question is, um, you know, if it has, uh, you know, has it lost its atmosphere like Mars? Or does it have a super, super thick atmosphere like Venus, which would then make it, uh, you know, really hot and, and, and the surface wouldn't be habitable? So there's all kinds of planets that can be in the habitable zone that are not habitable once you think about the actual planet. We've got four habitable worlds in this solar system, Venus, the Earth, the Moon, and Mars. Uh, three out of the four are not inhabited as far as we know, uh, nor could they support life as we know it today. But, uh, but one does, and uh, so that's, you know, that's what makes this so tantalizing. Joe, is there, are we going to be able to detect that atmosphere from, from ground-based observations here, or is that something that you actually have to get out there and see it for yourself? I think ground-based observations would be pretty challenging. But I, I'm hopeful for, if it transits, I'm hopeful for the James Webb Space Telescope, which launches in November of 2018. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, massive. And is large, <laughs> yes. It's six meters, right? And so uh, uh, certainly, you know, the, the current uh, ranking infrared space telescope is Spitzer. It's, it's 0.85 meters, right? So this is much, much bigger than anything we've had to work with in the infrared to date. And the reason I emphasize the infrared is that uh, that's where the spectrum of lots and lots of interesting molecules gets very easy to detect. 
In fact, the reason that you and I can't see in the infrared is that we would be looking through this spectrum of absorption in our atmosphere that would prevent us from seeing very far. Mm -hmm. And so our eyes are optimized into the what we call the visible window because the, the visible region of the spectrum is relatively boring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't, it's clear, mm -hmm. you can see stuff. Um, but if you're trying to examine the atmosphere rather than see through it, uh, you want to be in the infrared. And that's why we're excited about James Webb. And uh, James Webb will grab the, the entire near and mid infrared spectrum. Mm -hmm. And you know, if, if this planet transits, uh, Webb will go to town on it. Mm -hmm. Are you optimistic that, that this is a, a transiting planet? Um, when I'm not a scientist, I'm very optimistic. <laughs> when I'm a scientist, I try not to be either optimistic or pessimistic. I just try to do the work. <laughs> this discovery, or the announcement of this discovery, and the subsequent work that's going into it, how big is this for, for the world of planetary science and science in general? I think for the science of astrobiology, it doesn't get bigger than this outside the solar system. You know, we have been, uh, you know, there have been two things that we've been needing to do in astrobiology. One is uh, figure out what to look for and how to look for it. The other is figure out a place to look. We just checked that box. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the two big issues of astrobiology, of, of actually having a planet that is near enough that you can do a lot of sensitive measurements, or that you can even dream of doing them, uh, that's, we got that now. And in terms of, uh, you know, astrobiology in the solar system, then you're talking about, uh, you know, things to, to drill or melt through the ice of, of Europa or look in the Enceladus plumes or, or something like that, or dig in, you know, deep into the soil of Mars. I've been speaking with Joe Harrington. He's a professor here at the University of Central Florida. Joe, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that's going to do it for this episode. Support for Are We There Yet comes from the listeners of WMFE. You can follow the show online or on Twitter at AWTYMars or reach out to me in the Twitterverse. I'm at Space Brendan. Let's have a conversation. Leave us a review on iTunes. That's how more people learn about this podcast. Are We There Yet is a production of WMFE, and our theme music was composed by Kevin McLeod. For more space news online, visit WMFE.org space. I'm Brendan Byrne. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.